We are going to talk about alligator safety today for Del Webb Lakewood Ranch. So Cassie already introduced me, but here's a little bit more about myself. Uh, I am the Ecology Natural Resources Educator at your Sarasota County Extension Office, which is on Clark Road in Twin Lakes Park. Uh, programs that I teach include the Florida Master Naturalist Program, which I'll try to tell you about if I have enough time towards the end. It is an adult education program through University of Florida that teaches you all about our wonderful ecosystems here in Florida. And if you love nature or ecology, it's a great set of classes to take. I also do elementary school programs on environmental education for our third through fifth graders here in Sarasota County, as well as just a variety of informational classes like the one you're in today. I have a bachelor's degree in environmental studies from the cold white north up there in Buffalo, New York, where I'm from originally. I've been down here in Florida for over 25 years now, so I'm half Buffalonian and half Floridian now. And I actually have a medical degree and was a practicing physician for about 15 years until three and a half years ago, I decided I really wanted to come back to environmental education. I love both of those careers that I've had. Um, I love helping people and I am a resource in your community for you if you have questions about wildlife, plants, nature, things like that. So I have a little test for you guys ahead of time. I bet you didn't think you'd have a test today. So what I'd like you to do is in your chat box, if you can find your chat box, it's usually on the toolbar. You might have to move your cursor around so the toolbar pops up on your screen. And then there's a little icon that is your chat box. So what I'd love you to do is type in the number for each of these questions into the chat box if your answer is yes. So your answer might be yes to one of these questions, some of them or all of them. So if you have been to our Sarasota County Extension office or know what we do at Extension, put a one in the chat box. If you've seen an alligator here in Sarasota County, put a two or Manatee County. If you feel confident you know what to do if you encounter an alligator, put a three in that chat box. And if you're scared of alligators, we won't tell anyone, but give us a four in the chat box. So you might put one, two, three, and four in there, or you might just answer yes to um, a couple of these questions. So go ahead and take your time doing that. Number one, if you've been to our office or know what we do. Number two, if you've seen an alligator in Sarasota or Manatee County. Number three, if you feel confident, you know what to do if you see an alligator or come in contact with one. Number four, if you're scared of alligators. All right, thank you for doing that. Cassie is gonna try to tally those up for us and I'm gonna move on. So this is what we do at our office. Our office, the Sarasota County Extension Office is a partnership between Sarasota County and there's one in Manatee County. In fact, there's one in all 67 counties of our state. And we're a partnership between the county we're in and the University of Florida, as well as the USDA. So we have many different programs and the programs and the staff depend upon the needs of the community in the county they're in. In Sarasota County, we have a really large extension office. We have lots of staff and lots of programming um, available to help you or to answer your questions. So if you have questions or interests in any of these areas, you can check out our classes, most of which are free or low cost. They're all virtual right now. Or, or you can email or call our office if you have a question or need help. Currently, our office is open to the public, uh, but only a couple of us are in there each day as we're very carefully rotating through so that we keep our staffing on site at a minimum. But we are all e-working from our home offices, so we're available to our community. These are some of the programs that we do. Whoops, sorry. Um, and, okay, uh, up in the upper right hand corner there is the logo for the Master Naturalist program, which is one of my main programs that I mentioned earlier. Cassidy, can you see if you can clear the annotate function there and take the 
little blue lines off. I can't do it while I'm talking. And then this is just a reminder about the census. So um, the federal government is still doing the US census. If you have not been counted yet, if you've not mailed in your census or done it online, you can do it online still at census.gov. This information provides a lot of information to our government and our agencies, but it also helps provide funding. So um, please do your census if you haven't. All right, that's all my announcements. Let's move on to alligators. So alligators in Florida, the estimated population of alligators in our state is about 1.3 million. And there is a little over 20 million people currently in our state. So that's like one alligator for every 20 of us humans. So we have, oh, we have like over 50 people on the call. So that's like two and a half alligators should be in our Zoom room with us. Um, so there's a lot of alligators here. They're in all 67 counties and they basically can be found in any fresh water source. So swamps, rivers, lakes. I mean, here in Sarasota County, if you've been to Mayaka River State Park, I don't think you can come to Mayaka River State Park and go near water without seeing an alligator. So they really can be in any fresh water, but they also can be in brackish water. Brackish water is a combination between fresh and salt water. So you're gonna find that like in the intercoastal, in the estuaries, which is where the freshwater rivers come into either the intercoastal or the Gulf waters. So alligators are not gonna hang out for a long time in brackish water, but they can be found swimming around in there. There's even an occasional report of seeing them like near the beach in really salty water. They're not gonna do well there, they're not gonna stay there long, but they can go there from time to time. And if you think about the amount of people that are coming into Florida, there before COVID, there was a thousand people a day moving into Florida. So not just coming here to visit, like a thousand people actually coming here to take up residence. And so as our population continues to grow, because this is a great place to live, our possibilities of human and alligator interactions increase. So you're more likely to see alligators because we're living where they live. It's not so much like they're coming to where we live, we built where they were already living or we built over areas that we, they were living in and they started to move and then we start seeing them in our communities. And we're gonna talk way more about that. So let me just tell you a little bit. I like when I get asked to do these talks about things that people are concerned about, I really like to give you lots of information about the particular animal or situation because that's what helps us understand the animal or situation better. And that helps decrease our level of worry, concern, or even fear when we understand how much we need to be concerned or in this case, how amazing and important alligators really are. So in our area, in our, in our Southeast area, alligators, um, their populations decreased starting in the 1950s. And this was before the Endangered Species Act. It was because of habitat loss and hunting. And then they were listed as endangered in 1967, even before the Endangered Species Act was passed. And a lot of that was also because not only were they being hunted, but they were being hunted for fashion. So as you can see on the right, that's a purse made from a dwarf crocodile, but alligators were hunted for similar things, purses, belts, shoes, boots. Um, so it wasn't just for food or for sport, um, which of course were also depleting the populations. So alligators were endangered here until 1977. Now they are fully recovered. As you could see from the previous slide, we have lots of alligators here in Florida. And actually Florida and Louisiana have the most alligators of all the states where they're found. And I think that previous picture, yep, that previous slide right there on the bottom, the green area is where alligators are found. So they're in the southeast, they're along the Gulf Coast, and then up the Atlantic Coast, um, up into North Carolina. And here in Florida, they are still listed as a species of special concern, and federally they're listed as a species that is threatened due to similarity of appearance. 
And that's because alligators do look so much like crocodiles and crocodiles are endangered. And so when two species look so much alike to each other, we often list the species that has plenty of numbers as threatened due to similarity of appearance so that people don't take a crocodile and say, oh, I just thought it was an alligator. So now we have to list both of them as threatened so that people can't take either of them. Um, there are certain circumstances where alligators can be legally taken by individuals, but you need proper licenses and permits from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. So you can't just go rogue and decide you don't like the alligator that you saw the other day and go out and trap it or kill it. That is actually illegal because they are protected. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, which we usually just call the FWC, the FWC does sponsor a statewide alligator hunt like it does for some of the other um, animals in our state. And they do that based on the population of the alligators. So if the population of the alligators is doing really, really well and perhaps almost bordering on too many alligators, then they do a statewide hunt, which helps to keep that population really healthy. Ecosystems need to be balanced. That means we don't want too few of the species that should be in the ecosystem, but we also don't want too many. If we have too many alligators, not only do us humans get a little worried, but for the ecosystem, if we have too many alligators, then that decreases the amount of fish that are available for ospreys and eagles to eat, or you know, the alligators don't have enough food because they ate up all the fish and now the alligators are getting sick and dying. So it's not healthy for the species or the ecosystem for things to be out of balance. So there are very specific circumstances and permits. Um, they can only take a certain number of alligators. It's usually only two um, alligators per hunting season, which is once a year. So it is very limited, very restricted, and they restrict it by location too. So you can only, um, they only issue a certain number of permits for each location, depending on how many alligators are in the population there. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about alligators themselves. Um, that's a picture I took. That was a big old alligator. That was probably a male alligator um, because males are larger than females. That was at Booker Creek Preserve up in Pinellas County. Um, and I would say that one was a good 12 footer, I would say. And it's got, if you look at that alligator's throat, that also makes me think it's a male because the males have like this extra amount of throat that helps them bellow to the females. The females will make some noises too, but the males really, especially during mating season, will make this bellowing call and that, that um, tissue around the throat there will actually vibrate and that will help the sound. So when they're born, they're cute. They're nine to 10 inches. Everything's cute when it's first born, right? So they're nine to 10 inches when they're born and then they grow two to 12 itch inches every year depending on how healthy their environment is. So if there's plenty of food, there isn't a hurricane or a flood, everything's going just right, they might actually grow a foot a year. Females rarely get larger than 10 feet um, but males can get 12 feet and even beyond. The record length of an alligator in Florida was 14 feet, three and a half inches. That's huge. And the record weight of an alligator was over a thousand pounds. And that was up in Alachua County. You can estimate the length of the alligator by visually estimating the distance from the space between its eyes. So basically its forehead to the tip of its nostrils. So here in the magic world of Zoom, I'm gonna make myself really big for you guys, hopefully. You see me really big on your screen, I'm hoping. So here is an alligator skull. It's too big. Look, I'm trying to back up. It's really big. You can barely get it in the screen. So if this alligator were out swimming in a pond or lake and you saw it and you wanted to guess how big it was, but you could only see its head, 
you're clearly not going to go for a swim with a measuring tape. You can look with your binoculars or eyes and you can look where that ridge is, its forehead ridge basically between its eyes, and then guesstimate between its eyes all the way down to its tip of its nostril how long that is. This alligator skull, I would say that's a good at least 12 inches. This is a big skull. So this alligator was at least 12 feet long. So the number of inches between eyes to nostril is the number of feet basically that the alligator is. So this alligator, really cool looking skull. I'm gonna tip it over while I have myself on big screen show you the teeth. Well, the teeth aren't there, but look at the holes where the teeth would have been. And this alligator actually had some sort of injury. It's missing part of its jaw right here, its upper jaw. So we don't know if that's what caused it to die or if this was an injury earlier in life, which it looks from the skull that it was pretty well healed. So I'm assuming this is an injury from early in life, but it would be hard for us to really know. And probably intraspecific specific aggression, which is when alligators fight other alligators. And from the size of this, since it's a male, I'm assuming that it probably got injured in a fight with another male alligator. All right, let's see if I can make my magic happen and show you our presentation again. You guys see my presentation? Cassidy, give me a nod if you do. I see Amanda nodding. Hi, Amanda. All right, so let's keep going. So this is what alligators eat. Alligators are a predatory opportunistic feeder. That means, yes, they're predators, but they are opportunistic, which means what that really means is they're lazy. <laughs> they only want to eat things that are easy and that maybe walk or swim past them. Alligators don't make a lot of effort. They're not like a bobcat or a panther or um, and a predator like that that's going to make a ton of effort to get their food. They don't have to eat every day. They can go days without eating. So they are going to wait for something easy that comes by. They're not going to chase you. They're not going to chase your pet. But if your pet gets too close to the water and you have a small pet, well, that might look to the alligator like the alligator's normal food, like if you, a raccoon. So if you have a small dog or a cat, they're raccoon size and the alligator doesn't know the difference. So that's why we have to be really careful with our pets around freshwater bodies of water. But generally they're not going to make that much effort. They eat what is easy to get and happens to be in their way. Young alligators eat primarily insects, amphibians like frogs, small fish, and other invertebrates. So small alligators eat really small things. Adult alligators obviously are gonna eat bigger things. They're gonna eat fish, snakes. To me, it looks like the alligator in the picture, it looks like it's eating either a turtle or a melon. I'm not sure which, um, but it could be a turtle. That is one of their favorite foods. They also eat small mammals like raccoons or, I mean, they could eat a rabbit if they could catch a rabbit, but they're probably not gonna be able to. And birds, they'll eat birds, but once again, birds can fly away. Birds are smart too. So they're standing in the fresh water where the alligator is. Usually you don't even see alligators try to make an effort because they know that the bird is just gonna fly away and get out of the way first. So alligators reach sexual maturity at about six to seven feet long, and that takes about eight to 12 years for a male alligator or 10 to 15 years for a female alligator to get that big and reach sexual maturity. When they do, they will mate beginning in early April. Um, and this is when the alligators, especially the males, will make that bellowing sound. I have a couple alligator audio sounds that I'm going to share with you because you may or may not know what an alligator sounds like. Can you guys hear that? Okay, let me see if I can turn it up a little. Okay, let me play the other one too. Okay, 
It almost sounds like a growl, although they can make really loud noises as well. And um, th during mating season is when you guys hear about alligators on the news. It might be when you see alligators more commonly. So between May and June is usually when they start roaming around. So they're roaming around looking for, the boys are roaming around looking for the girls. So it's not necessarily that they're like trying to hang out around your house or anything like that. They are just, they're trying to find a girl and have some fun. So um, May and June is when we start hearing more alligator reports, when I start getting calls usually about alligators. Um, out of season, females stay much closer to their home base. So females generally in a species don't roam around as much as males do because females are the ones, whether it's a bird, a panther, an alligator, females are the ones of the species that are gonna stay close to the nest or wherever they have their babies and maybe take care of their young. Alligators don't really stay around to take care of their young but the females generally just don't roam around as much. Males can roam around for up to two square miles. And then both females and males during dry season may roam a bit looking for water. If where they were living dries up or the food source starts to decrease because the pond or whatever is drying up, then of course that alligator is gonna move on and try to find somewhere else to get in the water and eat its food. This is what a nest looks like. So females will build a large nest out of sticks and dried plants. Um, their nest can be two to three feet high and five to seven feet wide. And nesting usually occurs um, right about June through July. And that's where they're gonna lay their eggs, about 32 to 46 eggs. And then the females will stay by the nest to guard the eggs. They move the nesting material around similar to what birds do to help keep the temperature of the nest at a viable temperature for those eggs. Nests can be um, taken by things like raccoons, snakes can get into the nest and eat eggs. So there are a lot of predators that actually will attempt to eat those alligator eggs. So that female stays around, she'll make like a really deep hissing noise if something comes towards the nest. There's the eggs and a baby that has just been hatched. The eggs incubate for about two months, so they're going to hatch right about now, mid-August through early September. And you can sort of see on the picture there that the little babies, the hatchlings, they have an egg tooth, just like many of our birds do. So it's that little sort of thing sticking up on the top of its snout on its upper jaw. And the baby alligators use that to help get out of those eggs. Reptile eggs generally are very leathery. They aren't hard like bird eggs, but they still take a little work to get out of. And as we said before, they're about nine to 10 inches when they hatch. And as you can see in the picture, they tend to be like a darkish, brownish, blackish green with yellow stripes. And then those stripes will fade over that first year. And like with most reptiles, the temperature of the nest actually determines the gender of the baby alligator. So that's true for turtles as well, super interesting. So that's partly why the female is constantly adjusting the nest. Somehow she just knows how to keep it at a good temperature. And of course there's rarely a 100% female nest or a 100% male nest. It's gonna depend on where the eggs are in that nest and what their temperature was. But the researchers have looked at how temperature affects the gender and they find that if the nest is at the low end and cooler or at the very high end and very warm, you're more likely to have females. And then right in the middle between like 90 and a half to 92 and a half degrees, those are gonna be males when they're born. About one third of nests are destroyed by predators or flooding. So a third of those nests are not even gonna make it to hatching. About a third of the eggs in the nest that do make it don't even hatch. 
So this is why many of our wild animals are very prolific and they lay more than one or two eggs because so many of the eggs don't even make it. And then often the young don't even make it as well. So out of each nest, about 24 eggs are gonna hatch. About 10 of those will survive through their first year and only about five will survive all the way into sexual maturity and adulthood. So that's not very good if we start out with 32 to 46-ish and we only get five until they're able to reproduce again. So eggs are eaten mainly by raccoons, but also wild hogs, bears, and otters. Our juvenile alligators, the little babies, and the younger ones will be eaten by some of our larger mammals and wading birds, and also by other alligators. And then adults um, can, be, can be injured and die due to cannibalism, so eating each other, that does happen. Um, Intraspecific aggression, which is when the alligators fight each other and are injured to the point where they aren't gonna make it. And then of course, hunting by humans. If they do make it into adulthood, they can live 30 to 50 years. So here's just some close-ups of um, an alligator foot. So you can see how like they're amazingly strong and powerful. They also have pretty good claws on them. Uh, there's alligator tracks on the left-hand side of your screen. They're pretty distinctive. They don't really look like anything else. I mean, the, the one track looks a little bit like a raccoon track, but obviously raccoon tracks are gonna be only about an inch and a half long. And unless it's a baby alligator, it's gonna have a much bigger track than that. So nothing else really looks like this. So if you see um, tracks like this, th this track is probably, I think I see a boot track right there. So I'm guessing this alligator track is probably about as big as my hand. So pretty good size. Um, sometimes you'll even see, especially if it's wet mud, you'll see a tail mark too. You'll see um, the tracks on either side of a mark down the middle, which would be the tail dragging through the mud. And then probably the more common thing you might see is sort of a path through the grass or the vegetation on the edge of a pond or a lake. That is often, if there's a clear path, that is often going to be an alligator path, although it could have been made by another animal. Here's what their scat looks like. Scat is our scientific word for poop. And so I work a lot with third through fifth graders. So this is one of our favorite topics to talk about. You guys may not be as excited, but I love talking about scat. It's also a great way to recognize what animals might be in your area if you learn how to tell scat apart. Uh, I often get pictures of scat, so you're welcome to send me pictures of scat and I'll do my best to identify it. It's sort of a fun part of my job. Um, also, I was a doctor and a mom, so all sorts of poop in my life. Uh, so alligator scat, we don't see all that often. I don't know if that's because it's often by water or it gets washed away easily by the rain or we just don't, like I've hardly ever seen alligator scat. Um, so this is what it can look like. It looks white because alligators like birds only have one opening to excrete from. So they, they excrete through something called a cloaca and they excrete both defecation and uric acid, which would be like their urine. So uric acid turns white. So you may see something, and this is, I mean, I would say this is about the size of like a larger dog scat. So it may be all white or it may be some brown with a little bit of white on it as well. One of the questions I often get asked is, how do you tell the difference between a crocodile and an alligator? So do you think you could tell the difference between a crocodile and an alligator? It's pretty hard. I think I can do it. I don't see crocodiles all that often. I think I could probably tell them apart if they were right next to each other, but it might be harder if I only saw one and I wasn't sure which one it was. So crocodiles are not really found in Sarasota County. It would be unusual, it's possible, but it's a little too chilly here for them, believe it or not. So they're gonna be more in Southern Florida, like more in the Everglades area, but it is possible. Very unlikely though that they would be here. 
Um, a crocodile has a more narrow snout. So even though I'm in my tiny little window, I'm going to hold up the alligator skull again. So the alligator skull, remember this part's missing right here. So the alligator skull, hold on, there we go. At the tip of its nose is very U-shaped. It's very broad and round. The crocodile skull is going to be more V-shaped. They have a much more narrower snout that almost comes to a point. They are a little lighter in color. They're more grayish green, whereas our alligators are more darker brownish, maybe a little greenish, but really sort of dark brown. The main thing that people talk about is that crocodiles, you can see the lower teeth exposed when their mouth is closed. So that's what that red arrow is showing you. You can see both upper teeth and lower teeth. With alligators, you generally only see the upper teeth when their mouth is closed. Now, I don't know, most of us are either going to see the alligator swimming in the water or we're not going to be looking for its teeth. We're going to be thinking about maybe we should go the other way. So I don't really think the teeth thing is all that helpful. Um, so I think it's more about maybe the shape of their snout. That's a, that's a more obvious thing to notice. And also think about what environment you're in that you're seeing this reptile in. Crocodiles prefer to be in salt water and maybe brackish water as well, but crocodiles are more going to be in salt water. Alligators are going to be more in fresh water. Now they both can be in brackish water, so if you're in brackish water when you see one of them, that doesn't help you. Uh, crocodiles tend to be a lot more secretive, so you don't generally see them as easily anyways, even if you're in an area where they occur. So I'm going to try to answer some questions before you guys even get a chance to ask them of me. How long can alligators stay underwater? Their normal dives are only about four to six minutes long. So they don't go on under for very long, although they can stay under for longer than that. They may stay under for as long as 15-ish minutes, but um, 15 or less is really their general amount of time underwater. Some researchers did some research and figured out they could stay under for up to two hours, but that's highly unusual. Um, and if they're stressed out, they could actually drown if they're underwater for longer than 20 or 30 minutes. Are alligators cold-blooded? Well, yes they are. They're a reptile and reptiles are cold-blooded or ectothermic, which means that they rely on external conditions to regulate their body temperature. So if it is colder out here in Florida, it is less likely if you come upon a snake, an alligator, or a turtle that they're going to move very fast because they need the sun or something that's going to warm them up in order to increase their metabolism and get them moving and ready to go eat. So if it's cold, they're probably not going to move very fast. A lot of times we see alligators just what we call basking along the edge of a riverbank or a pond or lake bank. Well, that's because they're just trying to warm up. They're still chilly and they need their blood to warm up so they can get going. They're more active between 82 and 92 degrees. So right now they're not chilly, right now they're moving around. In our Florida winter, they are going to move slower and if the temperatures drop below 70 degrees, they're going to stop eating. And then if it gets as cold as 55 degrees, which it doesn't happen very often here in Sarasota County, then they're going to go dormant. But like higher up in the Gulf Coast states, um, they may actually have a period of dormancy if it gets cold enough. And then are alligators descended from dinosaurs? Well, yes, they are. And look at that really cool dinosaur from the late Cretaceous period. Um, so the order Crocodilia, which is the order that our reptile, our crocodiles and alligators and caimans belong to, that order appeared about 80 million years ago. So some form of alligators have been around for a really long time. Alligators' teeth were thought to be a magical ward against snake bite, so maybe that's why we have, you know, these versions of alligator teeth necklaces um, that still survive from a long time ago. Maybe people were wearing them because it helped survive from snake bite. Who knows? 
Alligators have about 74 to 80 teeth, and if they get damaged or break off, they will grow back, so they are able to replace their teeth. And the crushing force of an alligator's jaw can be 3,000 pounds per square inch. So their jaw, once it's closed, their jaw really does have quite a lot of force. They can swallow their food whole. Of course, it has to be, you know, a piece, depending on the size of the alligator, has to be a piece that fits in the alligator's mouth. But they have this thing in the back of their throat called a palatal valve that um, closes when they are hunting for food underwater so that they can catch their food and swallow it without a bunch of water getting into their lungs. Sort of a unique characteristic. And they have two sets of eyelids. They have an eyelid like ours that closes from the top to the bottom. That's their outer eyelid. But they have an inner eyelid that closes from back to front when they're underwater. And that one is clear. So it's basically like they're putting their scuba goggles on while they're underwater. Now here are some alligator myths. So how many of you have heard that you can avoid an alligator by running in a zigzag pattern? Yeah, so the people I can see are all raising their hands. So um, this is a common myth. Almost all of us have heard it. Some of us probably believe it. I have lots of people tell me that they can do this. I don't ever want to see you try because you'll fail. Really what you want is you want somebody who doesn't run as fast as you next to you, and then that's the person that's going to be in trouble. But just think about it. If you run in a zigzag pattern, the alligator, that takes a lot of effort. Alligators don't like to make a lot of effort. They are just going to run straight. So if they're running straight and you're running in a zigzag pattern, you're basically going to run right back into them. So running in a zigzag pattern will not help you. Alligators don't chase us anyways, although they can move faster than you would think. They can run up to 9 to 11 miles per hour when they want to, which isn't very often but they don't pursue us because we're too big and we're too much effort. They're also capable of swimming at speeds up to 10 miles per hour too, so they're good swimmers. That powerful tail helps to propel them through the water and they can also use that powerful tail to help push them up a fence as you see in that bottom picture there. So they can actually climb fences. And our last myth, do alligators make good pets? No, of course they don't because even though they're super cute when they're this small, they are not so cute when they're as big as that alligator climbing up the fence. It's also illegal to have alligators as pets anyways. So now we're going to talk about why alligators are actually important to our ecosystem. So you may have gotten this far and just been like, yeah, that's great stuff, Dr. Catherine. Nice to hear all this great stuff about alligators. I still don't like them. I still don't know why we have to care about them. It doesn't really matter to me. I don't really think they're cool and cute like you do. All right, well, if you aren't convinced yet, let me try to convince you now. So alligators make these things called alligator holes. They basically wallow a pit out in the mud this is really important, especially in the Everglades ecosystem. So when we go into our dry season, um, a lot of the more shallow bodies of fresh water will dry up. And there are a number of endangered species, especially some of our amphibians and fish that require water as part of their life cycle and specifically fresh water. So if some of those ponds and places with like the small um, marsh depressions, depressional marshes, if those dry up during our dry season, all of those other animals need to find a place to go. So alligators make this wallow or this alligator hole that then maintains water throughout the whole season. And this is a place where many animals will congregate and be able to survive the dry season. So they are really important. We actually call them a keystone species, which means that for all of you that are older like me and you remember when there were stone or brick bridges, so in order to get that arch, you need to have that keystone at the top, that triangular stone. And if you pulled that triangular stone out of the arch, of course the arch or the bridge is going to collapse. 
So alligators are called a keystone species because if they were not part of the ecosystem, the ecosystem could actually collapse. It wouldn't just have a little issue, it would have a big issue. They're also called indicator species because they indicate the health of the environment, sort of like canaries and coal mines. So if the environment is healthy, the alligators will be healthy. If we start to see a decrease in alligators, we know something is wrong with the health of the overall ecosystem. So if you care about the Everglades, if you care about ecology in our ecosystem and the balance of all of that, then by default, you sort of got to care about alligators too. So now I'm gonna talk about fears that people have about alligators and try to put it in perspective. And then we're gonna go into what you can do to be safe with alligators. And then we'll have time, we'll be close to the end and have time for Q&A. So mostly people fear getting bitten or hurt by an alligator, either for themselves or for small children or their pets. So most alligator bites happen because an alligator is attempting to eat some of them are defensive bites and happen due to unintended collisions while swimming. So one of the most important things we tell people is do not swim in fresh water, especially around dawn, dusk, or in the evening, because when it's darker out, that's when the alligators are feeding. You also would really want to avoid um, swimming in any fresh water during mating season. Uh, because, and during the season when they're nesting, so basically throughout the late spring and into the summer, because they are more active at that time. Um, since 1948, Florida averages about six unprovoked bites per year. So this is like somebody swimming and bumps into an alligator, and alligator thinks it's a turtle or a fish, and the alligator ends up biting the person. Um, or some other like horrible situation that you might see on the news. Um, there's also 3.5 provoked bites annually. So that's because somebody's harassing an alligator. Um, and often they're doing something stupid and honestly, often alcohol is involved in that situation. So um, the 3.5 provoked bites are because of us. So this is compared to 30 deaths due to lightning strikes and 270 injuries. So you're much more likely to be injured or die from a lightning strike than you are from an alligator. In 68 years, um, 24 bites have been fatal. One in 2016, one in 2015, and then the seven years before 2015, there were no fatal bites. And of course we had, unfortunately, an episode up in Orange County. It's probably been two or three years now. Um, that was one of the most recent ones on the news that was very sad because it was a young boy. So I'm not saying that it can't happen. I'm not saying that it's horrible when it happens, but it doesn't happen as often as we think it does. It is not as something that we need to be fearful of. It's something we just need to be cautious about. Um, and to be smart about alligators and freshwater. The likelihood of being seriously injured by an alligator bite in our state is roughly 1, 2, 1 in 2.4 million. So it is really unlikely. Um, you're much more likely to be struck by lightning, 1 in 13,500. And then yesterday I looked up how likely it was to win the Florida Lotto, and that's one in 24 million. So you're more likely to win the Lotto than you are to be bitten by an alligator bite, but um, you're way less likely to be, get, to be get bit by an alligator than you are to be struck by lightning. So, so let's talk about nuisance gators. When do gators become a problem? Well, the definition, there is actually a legal definition of a nuisance alligator. A nuisance alligator has to be at least four feet long. They don't even consider alligators smaller than four feet to be nuisances because they really can't do any damage to humans at that size. Um, the worst that could happen is they could bite and you'd get an infection um, because really at that size, they're eating super small fish and frogs. Um, if you, the alligator is larger than four feet, in order to be considered a nuisance gator, they have to pose a threat to people, pets, or property. 
So they have to be showing some sort of dangerous type of behavior. And then the FWC does run a nuisance alligator line. So there's a phone number there that um, is the number that if there was a serious concern about a nuisance alligator, that is who you would call. And then what the FWC generally does is they ask you some questions on the phone to try to triage whether or not they think it's a problem or not. If they really do think that there's a concern, they send out a trapper to remove that alligator. And when that happens, that means that the alligator is gonna be put to death. It's gonna be euthanized. Alligators are not relocated. Um, you can't relocate alligators. Um, if it really is a problem alligator, it would just cause a problem somewhere else. And if you move it to somewhere far farther away, first of all, that's super expensive to do. So it would increase our tax money. But also, alligators can sometimes find their way back to where they wanted to be in the first place. So once a trapper comes out, then that animal is going to be euthanized. Um, and really, the main cause of alligators becoming nuisance alligators is people feeding them. So the main thing we can do to help save our alligators and to keep ourselves, our children, and our dogs safe is to never feed an alligator and to educate people never to feed alligators. Because once you feed an alligator, the alligator sees people as an easy source for food and they lose their natural fear of us. And then if we're down by the water, if our pet is down by the water, if we're cleaning fish down by the water and an alligator associates human beings with easy food, they're much more likely to come towards us or even try to grab for that food. That's when we see problems. So generally, if an alligator has not been fed, an alligator sees a human and goes the other way. FWC receives about 16,000 complaints a year, which leads to about 7,000 of those alligators being trapped and killed. They do reuse all parts of the alligator, so at least um, it's not a complete waste, but I would be happier if we were not having to kill 7,000 alligators a year. The average size of alligators that are trapped are is about seven feet long. So here we go. This is what you guys need to do. If you are worried about alligators, you're concerned about them, you see them around, um, you're fearful of alligators, you have people visiting you that are concerned about alligators, here's the, here's the meat of the story that you wanted to know when you got on today. So never feed an alligator, my number one thing, so important. Um, you want to stay in assigned swimming areas if you're going to swim in fresh water and you want to be aware of your surroundings anytime you're near fresh or brackish water in Florida because there's a lot of alligators and they live here and that's where they live, fresh and brackish water. Closely supervise your children and pets when they're around fresh water and try to keep them 10 feet away from the water's edge. So if you're walking your dog, don't go down near the edge of your stormwater retention pond or a lake because there could be an alligator there and you just don't know. So just stay 10 feet away. Alligators are not going to lunge out of the water at your pet. They are most active between dusk and dawn, so don't swim at night or let your pet swim. Um, also, if you want to take pictures of alligators, stay a distance away from them. If you're a fisher person, please don't dispose of your fish scraps in the water because that's another way that inadvertently alligators start to associate us with an easy food source. You don't ever want to handle an alligator. It is illegal and can result in injury. And if you see an alligator in an unwanted area, which is probably gonna happen during mating season, and we always see on the news an alligator under somebody's car or by somebody's front door or garage, generally, if you just wait until that alligator moves on, that's all you need to do. They're just out looking for a girl or out looking for a new water source. And you wanna educate others. That's really the more people understand not to feed alligators, the less problems we're going to have. And they are protected by state law, so you can't kill them, harass them, you can't have them as a pet, and you can't feed them. That is against state law as well. 
Here's the information. Cassidy is going to put this link in your chat box because you can't click on your screen to get to the link, but she's going to put this link and another link from the FWC in your chat box, which will get you to more information about alligators. Um, we may also, Amanda may be able to send these out for us too, I'm not sure. Um, but this, uh, the two links she's going to give you are links that provide you with lots more information. You can even download the pamphlet that you see on the right hand side about a guide to living with alligators that says a lot of the same stuff I've just shared with you today. I had a question yesterday when I did this for another HOA community about whether or not there are caimans in Florida. Uh, there should not be caimans in Florida, but we do occasionally have uh, the spectacle caiman, um, generally more in the southern part of Florida as an invasive species, meaning they should not be here and they should be reported if somebody does see them. So it's unusual, but I thought I'd throw it in there since somebody asked me yesterday. Here are some of the references on information about alligators. So that's just where I got my information for today's presentation. And I wanna thank you guys for taking your time to be here with me. Please feel free to reach out to me at any time. My website is up there. And we have a survey. So if you don't have any questions and you're gonna get off in a minute, um, please complete the survey. It helps us to continuing, continue to do quality programming if we know how you feel about what we did for you guys today.